Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Alcohol Facilitated Sexual Assault, Who Needs Force When You Have Alcohol, Part 2. Today's program is presented by Equitas. My name is Cynthia Hatchell, and I'm the project coordinator at Equitas, and I will be moderating today's webinar. If you have a question during the presentation, please enter it in the chat box to your right. We will answer questions at the end of the webinar. You are also welcome to contact us directly at any time following today's presentation, and we will send you contact information during our follow-up. Equitas's mission is to improve the quality of justice in sexual violence, intimate partner violence, stalking, and human trafficking cases by developing, evaluating, and refining prosecution practices that increase victim safety and offender accountability. Next slide. As a national training and technical assistance provider, Equitas develops resources, conducts trainings, and offers 24-7 consultations for prosecutors and allied professionals. For more information on Equitas, please visit our website at equitasresource.org. Next slide. You can also follow Equitas on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. A link to each is available on our website. Next slide. Today's webinar is supported by the U.S. Department of Justice Office of Violence Against Women. The information presented in this webinar does not necessarily reflect the views of the Office of Violence Against Women. Next <laughs> slide. Presenting our webinar today are Equitas Attorney Advisors, Jonathan Curlin and Patricia and Patricia Powers. Currently an attorney advisor with Equitas, John Kerlin worked for 16 years as a prosecutor in the district attorney's office in Berks County, Pennsylvania, serving as chief deputy district attorney, chief of trials, and assistant district attorney. Throughout his career, John has successfully prosecuted a variety of offenses, including domestic violence homicides, campus sexual assault, cold case sexual assaults, intimate partner violence, stalking, child pornography and exploitation, child abuse and molestation, and human trafficking. Patty Powers joined Equitas as an attorney advisor after serving as a senior deputy prosecuting attorney in Washington State for 27 years. During her tenure as a prosecutor, Patty supervised the sexual assault domestic violence unit in her office. She frequently and successfully prosecuted sexual assault, domestic violence, child abuse, and related homicides, which included comp complex litigation of high profile and cold cases. For five years, Patty served as a highly qualified expert for the United States Army Central Intelligence Command, through which she consulted and provided specialized training on military sexual assault and domestic violence. I will now turn it over to Jonathan Curlin and Patty Powers. Hello, everyone. I'm Patty Powers, and I'm honored to join with my colleague John Curland in continuing our webinar presentation of Who Needs Force When You Have Alcohol. We're, we're going to focus today on the heartbeat of our work, the interview of the victim of sexual assault, as well as strategies for direct examination of the victim at trial. Ensuring that the interview is trauma-informed provides the victim with a true opportunity to be heard, as well as an important means for us as allied professionals to obtain the fullest possible information that the victim is able to provide about the experience of the crime. As we build our case, we're going to engage in pretrial litigation that ensures the jury's opportunity to render a just verdict based upon admissible evidence. Working with allied professionals, as we'll discuss, allows us to develop a heightened understanding of the evidence of victimization, as well as providing holistic support to the victim throughout our work in the criminal justice system. Laser-like focus on the offender, how the offender caused victimization and committed this crime is critical 
to our efforts to connect the jury with evidence of offender accountability. Our work is characterized by this mission, ensuring that our efforts are supportive of the victim, as well as obtaining the fullest information possible about the victim's experience of the crime. This is critical to later building a link between the jury and the victim. Offender focus is also an important and interrelated aspect of our work. We all know that for the most part, sexual assault, and that includes alcohol facilitated sexual assault, is premeditated or planned to some extent. And our efforts to focus on the offender needs to begin very early in our work. First, do no harm. We're going to turn now to trauma-informed interviewing, which again relates back to the heartbeat of our work, and that's the victim's disclosure. We all know that during our current period of time, we're challenged by concerns with the spread of the COVID-19 virus, as well as the needs throughout our communities in the United States for social distancing. And this has truly impacted our work as service professionals in the areas that you now see before you. We still have the opportunity to interview and provide services to victims, but we're in the process of developing ways to be truly supportive for victims while engaging in social distancing and a virtual interview, as opposed to our previous in-person interviews. And we want to make sure that we accommodate a victim's presence whenever the victim desires to be present or to participate in a court proceeding. Many of our jurisdictions around the country are now involved in Zoom proceedings, uh, and we certainly have the opportunity to help connect a victim in those proceedings as well. We're working with severe systemic delay. We know in many jurisdictions, trials and other proceedings have been delayed for a lengthy period of time in some. And during this time, it becomes critical for us as service professionals to make sure that we are supporting our victims and also helping them to maintain their engagement in the criminal justice system. Closed circuit cameras and teleconferencing are also options that are used in many different areas in our country. So in turning to the infrastructure of a trauma-informed interview, we want to make sure that we're establishing the critical rapport that is so necessary to our work as interviewers. And we may be doing this through Zoom or through teleconferencing, but however we approach it, we need to be fully present to the victim just as we would if we were in an in-person situation. Protecting against victim blaming is also important to our work. It's never the victim's fault, as we all know. Service professionals may be called into situations that are challenging, and sometimes there may even be concerns with the spread of the virus. Whatever that situation is, the victim does not have responsibility. The offender has responsibility for the crime. We need to make sure that we have advocacy support immediately available to victims, and we want to make sure that we're providing an opportunity for private communication. In many jurisdictions, this is being accomplished through virtual communication. It's also important to determine whether we're going to record or use video. And the reason why this becomes important, this may be a, a difficult situation for some victims, we also know that there are important policy considerations and we need to have consistency as much as possible while still being flexible to meet a victim's needs if there are concerns. We also know that if we have a recording, whether it's audio or whether it's a video with audio, that this also is going to be discoverable. Work product still applies to case preparation but if this is an interview that is going to form the foundation uh, for any material later, then there may be discovery issues associated with it. These are some of the effects of trauma that we're going to be discussing. We'll talk about the common effects of trauma, 
and sometimes the effect of trauma on a person's ability to form a memory. We want to the extent possible minimize re-traumatization in our work and we do this through a trauma-informed approach to interviewing. Ultimately, we're seeking to obtain the fullest amount of information that the victim is able to provide because we want to recreate the reality of this crime ultimately for a jury in our cases. And this quotation from Judith Herman is important. Traumatic events are extraordinary, not because they occur rarely, but rather because they overwhelm the ordinary human adaptation to life. Now let's think about that for a moment. In terms of understanding a victim's trauma, we need to know that only the victim is going to be able to understand to the fullest extent how that trauma has changed her life or changed his life. But we need as service professionals to be aware that this is literally an overwhelming event that has interrupted a victim's ability to adapt to the circumstances that the victim is now trying to live through. And stress and trauma are also distinguishable. We know that traumatic events are the more extreme versions of stressful events. When stress is taken away, the effects of stress are going to be alleviated, but the effects of events that are truly traumatizing are going to continue well after those events are over. And the memories of that event is going to linger on. And we know that the body may never fully recover from this event, and we know that the psychological impact is also ongoing. And this is important for us to know because the victims that we're privileged to work with are still very much under the effects of the traumatic event. And they're going to be individual effects. There isn't a blueprint or a one size fits all. We know that cognition and behavior can also be affected by trauma. But we need to, as best as we're able to, recognize some of the common reactions so that we can understand when the victim presents with these reactions that they are impacted by trauma. And that's critical to our work as service professionals. These are just a few of the common reactions. And as we're looking at this graphic, I want all of you to think about the victims that you're privileged to serve and how frequently you've encountered many of these common reactions. Sometimes just trying to reach a decision on when would be the best time to come to our offices for interviews may be very difficult for a victim. Sometimes during the interview, it may be very difficult, if not even impossible, for a victim to reach back into her memory and, and to try to access memories in response to our questions. And we've learned as professionals in this area that we don't ask questions just based upon chronology. What happened first, what happened second, what happened right after that, because trauma may interrupt the flow of that memory and a victim may simply be unable to access a chronological event. We know that sometimes it becomes too painful for victims and there may be a recantation or maybe a minimizing, which is a way of trying to lessen the impact of trauma for many victims. There can be changes in personal hygiene, eating or sleeping, and these can also impact a victim in their ability to work with us as criminal justice professionals. There can be an entire range of emotional responses, and all of these may be specific to victims and the trauma that they've undergone. Returning to normal life, if there is such a thing after a trauma such as sexual assault, is going to be certainly an obstacle for many victims. Withdrawing and, and being dependent upon others, again, may be another reaction. We're going to talk about taking a different approach. There used to be a, con a concern that a victim should be interviewed once because to continue our process and to interview a victim more than once would be injurious, but we've learned that this is a process and that many times more than one interview is going to be necessary. And this is victim-centered. It allows the victim time to process 
and to develop an ability to further disclose, which is important in many cases. And other times, we simply need to ask for additional information based upon the investigatory evidence that we're developing. It may take time for a victim to be able to disclose. It may come about as a process. It may even be in layers. But we need to be open and aware, again, to the impact of trauma and how important it is to allow the victim a true opportunity to be heard, to make known what the victim's experience of the crime was. And the neurobiology of trauma also may affect a victim, and there may be additional effects upon chronology, as I mentioned earlier, and sometimes on the ability to form memories. As we discussed in our last webinar, it's important to recall that even if a victim is impacted by alcohol, trauma is still on board. This is a quotation from Dr. Rebecca Campbell that really summarizes what we're discussing. The story can come out in bits and pieces and fits and starts and then cycle back over itself or, oh, oh wait a minute, I remembered this detail. It comes out in a very disorganized way. That's due to the impact of trauma. So in terms of multiple interviews, we know that during the first interview, we want to build rapport. We want to establish with the victim our commitment to the work that we do and the honor that we have of, of providing the victim with the true opportunity to tell what happened. We'll look toward establishing the general information of the case, which will give us a chance to focus on possible evidentiary leads. We'll also want to talk about a safety plan because we know unless we can provide safety and that's both physical and psychological safety to a victim it may be very difficult for a victim to stay the course and then we'll plan for follow-up the follow-up will come from the foundation that we established in the first interview and we'll be gathering more detailed information as we proceed Thank you, Patty. Uh, this is where I'm going to uh, sort of pick up on um, trauma-informed interviewing, where Patty has start, uh, left off. And I also want to thank Cynthia for moderating today. And initially, before I jump off, I want to thank all our uh, folks who are attending today, especially those of you who are rejoining us from uh, part one, which we held last week. So picking up on uh, the multiple interview idea that Patty just talked about, and hopefully right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there's more opportunity for these middle, uh, multiple interviews without having the, uh, the stress and strain on our schedules of day-to-day -day court obligations. And so this can be an opportunity to really start building these relationships with our victims. But a lot of times for that first interview, we want to view that almost as an opportunity for rapport building. And broadly speaking, the purpose of rapport building with our victims it's not just a formality, but it's really a, a fundamental and key component that's gonna be the foundation as we work through the rest of our case with our victim. Because one, it's going to hopefully be able to build trust with our victim and establish that trust uh, for us with them. But the other factor that it's going to do is that with a good rapport building, and this is something that forensic interview training with children talks about a lot, a good rapport building is going to be able to help us adapt ourselves to the victim, adapt ourselves to how the victim communicates, how they're comfortable. So rather than the non-trauma-informed approach, which is an expectation, a lot of times unspoken, that the victim's gonna adapt themselves to our standards, rapport building is a chance for us to learn about the victim and see how we can shape and comport our practice with them. Uh, by not just learning how they speak uh, in, in, in the level with which they speak, but also things like outside pressures and scheduling pressures that we can remember in the future and be taking into consideration as we're working with our victim and getting to know our victim throughout the case. It, it has a, a, a fundamental return for us as prosecutors, but it also is victim-centered in, in the sense that it's making the victim realize that they are the priority. So it's not only going to be the, the right thing professionally, it can be the right thing emotionally and just as a good person to do. If you could advance to the next slide, please. The other part of 
trauma-informed interviewing is at some point having a honest and candid conversation with the victim. And we have to recall and remember with a lot of our victims who are, who are gonna be impacted by trauma and entering into this criminal justice system, more often than not something that's alien to them, they are going to be full of fear. They aren't gonna have any basis where they are gonna be sure they can trust us, that they're gonna to wanna to be taking a blind jump. So what we wanna be sure of is when we're working with the victim, is that we let the victim know proactively and explicitly uh, that we're not judging them for what disclosures we want to, that they, they are going to give us and what they are going to offer us. We want to be honest and open about our role. And as much as we can, we want to help the victim be comfortable. Now is not the time, of course, for any sort of power trip or to revel in our authority figure, because that's probably something as prosecutors that the victim already views us as. As much as we can, we want to try to be on that level playing ground with the victim so that we can get that relationship and that feeling of trust and help facilitate the victim's disclosure. A lot of things, especially viewing us as, as part of law enforcement and as an authority figure, there might be a lot of things about uh, the victim's background and what occurred during the crime that they're not going to feel comfortable talking to us about that they're gonna be embarrassed by, that they're gonna be wondering if we're gonna be judging them for. We wanna to try to alleviate those concerns up front and let the victim know that the more they are able to share with us, then the better position we can be as prosecutors to try and help them. Let them know that some information, there might be an opportunity to keep out, especially rape shield information that, uh, that would be prohibited under rape shield information, which we're going to talk about later. But also help the victim understand that even if we can't keep it out, there might be ways we can blunt it or minimize that disclosure. And of course, realizing that mo more often than not, what the victim is afraid of, the defendant or offender is already recognized or identified as a vulnerability and is planning to bring out anyway. So helping us to prepare for that and uh, in letting the victim know the importance of that in our role that it's ultimately there to help them can be a, a good trauma-informed approach. If you could advance to the next slide, please. Now, trauma-informed questioning, what sorts of things? It, it's not just, it, in, in a lot of ways, it's not at all a chronological narrative we're trying to elicit from the, the, the victim because a lot of trauma recognizes same thing that Dr. Campbell was talking about, is that a victim is only going to be remembering things in bits and pieces. And so really what a lot of trauma-informed interviewing and questioning comes down to is in some measure getting the victim to feel as safe and comfortable as possible so they can disclose as much as they are able to close, disclose, which might not be everything. And it might be gradual, it might be a process, but the kinds of things that we can learn from the victim in a trauma-informed questioning, we're looking at as a foundation to build the rest of our investigation. And so in part of trauma-informed questioning, we're not just ticking off whatever elements we need to prove our offenses or to prove our crimes, but we're trying to recognize and build the whole scenario in context of what happened to this victim in this crime. And this means trying to appreciate and solicit and inquire about sensory details, uh, the emotional response, which how they felt about when something happened, what they thought. For a lot of victims, that could be the jumping off point that can start connecting to other memories and start stringing these, me these memories together. And also a physiological effect, like ask them about how they physically felt. These kinds of questions can not only help facilitate disclosure, but it might also really help victims and give us details at trial that really can help bring the reality home to our fact finders, to our courts, and to our juries. So when we're asking these questions, we always want to be recognize, recognize and remembering that a lot of our victims, they're coming to us. It's a miracle they were able to disclose, because of course most victims never do. And a lot of victims are already second guessing and self blaming. We don't want to compound that with questions that can be perceived or sound judgmental. So we also want to be very careful about how we phrase questions, how we're raising questions, 
and again, if there is a question that in, in some sense we have to know about, like if we want to know how much our victim was drinking in an alcohol facilitated sexual assault, especially, we want to provide our victim with the context of why we're asking that question so it won't be perceived as judgmental. Uh, so a, a, if we're asking about how much alcohol they drank, maybe we want to preface it that with the context of, listen, I want to try to see if you can, if you're able to tell me how much you drank that night or how much alcohol you, you, you consumed, I'm trying to figure out or find evidence about how vulnerable you were to this offender and how the offender knew about it. As much as we are able, we never want to have some sort of secret sauce that we're keeping from our victims. The more transparency we can offer about what we're doing and why we're doing, the more empowering victims, the more empowering of victims we will be, the more victim-centered and facilitating their disclosure. Uh, next slide, please. So what's a good way to sort of recast these questions that framed a certain way could be coming across as judgmental? Well, we at Equitas, we always call this the Patty Powers slide because it's so fantastic. But the magic word we can use to take any sort of question that might seemingly seem adversarial is by using the word able, inserting that with all our questions to the victim, not only when we're interviewing them, but as we're going to talk about later when we're direct examining them. This word able is so fantastic because when we use the word able, it recognizes implicitly that trauma has placed limitations on a victim's ability to disclose. And it concedes that and it recognizes that. So here are some great examples of using that tool to ask a, a questions in a trauma-informed manner. What are you able to tell me about? And question framing that way rather than what did you remember or what did you do or why did you do that? The why questions are always, almost always gonna be not very trauma informed, but it's communicating to a victim. Oh, can you go back please? But it's communicating to the victim they may not be able to remember everything. Um, the are you able to remember, hitting that area recognizes it look, gaps in memory are expected and recognizing, and also the other reframing of it, let me know what you're able to remember about. If we could go to the, the funnel slide now. Thank you. So the form, or rather the mechanics of a lot of trauma interviewing, and there isn't any one size fits all, and we're not trying to suggest or, or maintain that, uh, but one sort of mechanical approach about how we take the, these precepts of trauma-informed principles and actually bring it to an interviewing session or a questioning session or an, even a direct examination is the funnel approach. And in, in essence, what that means is starting as wild, widely as possible with a victim about what happened then with an incident and then narrowing down to the specific. We could go to the next slide. Now, a funnel approach, it really comprises different types of questions. The beginning type of question with this funnel approach is going to be the open-ended questions. That's going to be interspersed with the closed questions or follow-up questions, which we're going to unpack a little bit later, and a sort of wrap-up or summary question at the end. Let me go talk a little bit about the open question. What the open question, and this is really a, a big essence of what a trauma-informed questioning is, it's inviting the victim to volunteer as much information as possible. It's trauma-informed because the open question, what are you able to tell me? It's not tying the victim to any chronological sequence. It's essentially, in a lot of ways, an initial information dump from the victim that we're going to use to find details, so sensory details and uh, emotional and physiological details that we're going to use to build the rest of our questioning and build the rest of our investigation. The important thing is, and the opening questions are usually happening in the beginning of the interview or the opening portions of different parts of, of what the victim is there to disclose to us, but with the open-ended question, what's important and critical to remember, and could certainly be difficult for me to remember as a prosecutor, because I love to talk, is to listen, to not interrupt the flow of the story. By giving the victim essentially just a free flow, a free association about what you're remembering, in a lot of ways, we're helping them sew their memories together, or as much as they are able to remember, which is why it's so critical 
that we just listen as carefully as possible and we save our questions until the response to our open-ended question is finished. Which brings us next to closed questions. These are closely related to the follow-up questions and what the closed question is, it's narrowly tailored to seek a one or two word answer. In other words, if, they, if in the open-ended response our victim talked about something that we just wanted to confirm or get a detail, but we didn't want to interrupt their flow, the closed question is there to just sort of firm up or go, go to that detail. Uh, and here are some examples of things that, that might have been implied with the information provided in the open-ended answer by our victim, but wasn't clear. And the closed question is getting that clarification. It's closely related to, but distinct from our follow-up question. And what the follow-up question is, it's going to be used to clarify or ask our victims to add on to a response to an open-ended, to their response or information they provided in the open-ended question. Um, some examples, if our victim in the open-ended, can you, uh, you talked about getting in a car. Uh, the follow-up question is then going down that avenue. You got into the car. What do you remember about when you got in the car? Uh, what do you remember seeing or hearing or smelling or anything of that nature? And then following from that detail. And then this goes to summary questions, which is at the close of the interview or a close at a section of an interview. This is more just a sort of confirming whether or not we get the, we understood the victim correctly. And be sure we let the victim know, and hopefully the work we did in rapport is going to help us understand this, but let the victim know that if we misunderstood something or misstated something, to correct it or clarify it for us. And our summary is where we talk to the victim about what our understanding is, and then they help elaborate or explain anything that we might have misunderstood or omitted. And the kinds of summary questions or the depth of summary questions we want to ask, a good rapport building is going to help us inform like what kind of strategy we want to use with our summary questions. So going next to details, when we're getting into details, an open-ended narrative approach, it's going to elicit <laughs> sensory details that can allow a victim to describe the assault in his or her, her, his own words. And sometimes those sensory details might not be elicited until we're patient and listen and we get to ask those follow-up questions. But we want to pay attention and give respect to those small details that the victim is focusing on because they can turn out to be critically important and part of the building blocks that we're going to be building the rest of our case and the rest of our investigation on. What we're, what we're doing, and John has done a great job of, of giving us the necessary foundation for it, we want to recreate the reality of the victim's experience of the crime through sensory details. And ultimately, this is going to be an important path for us to really communicate with the jury what happened to the, to the victim, what the offender did. And these are just a few examples of it. Are you able to remember if you smelled anything when you were in the room? Do you recall any sounds? Did you, did you hear anything uh, in the distance? When the offender was on top of you, were you in a position to see his eyes? So many victims will respond that they did have a glimpse of the offender's eyes. And we'll go on to ask them to describe what his eyes looked like. And you'll hear various descriptions, including they were mean, ugly, angry, violent. He never looked that way before. And we all know that for a victim of sexual assault, regardless of the acquaintance with the offender or the relationship with the offender, at the moment of the sexual assault, the offender is the stranger, someone the victim did not know. And we hear this very often from victims of alcohol facilitated sexual assault. So one of the decisions that prosecutors and other professionals around the country are making is, is whether the interview should be recorded or not recorded. And there are a number of, of advantages and a number of issues involving this particular decision. Obviously, if we have a recording, we're going to have documentation. Documentation of the questions that were asked, the responses that were made. If with a video recording, 
and this is basically what we're talking about in this area, we're also going to be able to see the victim's demeanor when she is providing various aspects of experience. And that can be important as well with our objective of recreating the impact, the true reality of this crime. We can listen, we don't need to be taking notes and, and become distracted from information that the victim is providing. We also know that witnesses are not needed for impeachment, should that become an issue at any point. If the offender is at any time threatening uh, a victim with anything happening, if the victim continues her involvement or provides any other kind of obstacle or barrier to the victim's testimony, this would give us a basis for forfeiture by wrongdoing and we'd have a record of an interview that we would be asking the course to admit. There can be some potential technical difficulties and impact on our financial resources. Victim privacy, we need to reach that decision thinking about the trauma that the victim has suffered and the victim's ability to provide information in this kind of a setting with the recording. Once we enact a policy, we need to make sure that the policy is applied consistently, but still with some flexibility for a situation where a victim may be unable uh, to provide information in that kind of a setting. So these are all issues that are important to us as prosecutors, but again, a multidisciplinary collaborative approach is surely the best way to go when we're trying to achieve this decision. Patty, can I add one point to that really quickly? Absolutely. With COVID-19 or the COVID-19 environment, when we might be doing more remote or teletype interviews, uh, the technology to record those is pretty available. If we're not, if we're making the decision to not record, uh, then we should have a good strategy or rationale that can explain that because the decision not to record might come under attack later from defense attorneys. That, that's a great point, John. And following up on that, uh, if foreseeably there is some information that would be subject to disclosure, Brady information as an example, then what we would need would be a witness to provide that information, someone other than the prosecutor, if the prosecutor is doing that interview. So these really are issues uh, to be determined. And again, a multidisciplinary collaboration would be a great way to go in this regard. We're going to turn next to pretrial litigation. And our goal in this area is to ensure that the jury is able to reach a fair and just verdict for everyone involved, but based upon admissible evidence. There may be motions in limiting uh, prohibiting the introduction of certain materials brought by the prosecutor. And the way that we approach this is making sure that the judge is absolutely informed of the nature of the material that we'd like to restrict. So we're going to preview the evidence for the judge in a pretrial setting. If there are any legal issues involved, we're going to brief those issues so the judge and other counsel can be informed as to the applicable law in the area. What we want is the judge to establish the evidence that can and cannot be admitted at trial. We don't want any of our witnesses to be in the position, unless it can be avoided, of, of hearing an objection with the judge excusing the jury and then taking up an argument that we really could have developed uh, more expeditiously if we had done it at pretrial. It's important also, once the judge enters the rulings in a pretrial setting to make sure that all of our witnesses are informed. We don't want to have a witness, witness who's answering a question in good faith to very inadvertently go into an area that's been prohibited by the court. That's a, that's a very difficult situation for a witness and also for us as prosecutors. So we wanna make sure that everyone is on board and fully understanding any restricted areas of testimony or evidence. And so what this really requires of us is knowing our case inside and out. We've charged our case, we're confident in our ability to present this case to a jury and establish all of the elements of the crime to ensure offender accountability. So we need to think it through. And if there are any issues or any areas 
that the judge should be involved with in terms of rulings, we want to bring those up early in the process. You're seeing now uh, Federal Rules of Evidence 412 Rape Shield, which all states uh, have rape shield laws. And what's important for us to remember about this is that this is the area that so many victims are concerned about. How many times in, in your individual practices, those of you that are joining us today, have victims said something to this effect? Are they, get, are they going to get to know everything that I've ever done in my life? Are they going to know about people that I might have gone out with, any problems that I've had? Victims need to know about our efforts to ensure the fair and just application of rape shield. As noted in the advisory committee notes we're all looking at, the rule aims to safeguard the alleged victim against invasion of privacy, potential embarrassment, and sexual stereotyping that's associated with the public disclosure of intimate sexual details and the infusion. And sometimes as we know it's subtle, but the infusion of sexual innuendo into the fact-finding process. So we need to look carefully at any potential for an invasion of rape shield. This needs to be discussed with the victim and we should proactively surface this in a pretrial setting to make sure that we have the court's ruling uh, before proceeding. And the other thing is also, it can also give us a clear in-depth picture of what the defense might be in this area and what kind of information the defense might be seeking to bring to the jury's attention. We're looking now at protective orders and these are very important to our work. In terms of public disclosure or FOIA type laws, every jurisdiction in our country has a form of, of laws that allow for the public disclosure of certain requested information. And there are a number of statutory exceptions to this. So many offices around our country have taken up the use of protecting the identity of the victim through the use of initials. Now we always maintain original reports, always with, if, with the name mentioned and any other name mentioned, but sometimes there can be a substitution of initials for the victim. Sometimes also pursuant to certain statutes, there can be a redaction of identifying information. This may be a social security number, it may be an address, it may be a landline, it may be a cell phone. We want to try to also guard against the disclosure of information that is privileged and should be privileged. And again, we go back to the importance of a collaborative, multidisciplinary approach we may not be informed that the defense is seeking to subpoena a victim's counseling records. We may not know that a victim has been in counseling, but an offender who has had a, an acquaintance or relationship with the victim may know, and the offender's attorney may serve a subpoena ducis tecum on a counseling organization. So having the good offices of that organization that we've worked with collaboratively to let us know that that's being done is also important. Same photographs done with colposcopy are also very sensitive pictures of victims. They <clears throat> generally are not included with medical records, but there may be an indication that there are photographs. We certainly want to guard against uh, the disclosure or providing copies of those photographs. There certainly can be notification to counsel that they exist, but the court can certainly restrict any kind of dissemination of those photographs, which are, again, very private and personal to the victim. There are also privacy concerns that are important. Social media, cell phones in the courtroom. Counsel should be in a position to discuss this with the court prior to any proceeding in court, whether it's trial or pretrial, uh, and make sure that we're giving this information to the victim. It can have a very chilling effect on a victim if a person in a courtroom who's associated with the offender holds a cell phone up, whether, whether recording that or not, this can be a signal to a victim and it can be a major concern in testimony. So we want to, again, 
expand our efforts to work with the court and address these issues. John? Thank you, Patty, for talking about uh, some of the tools we can use to protect victims after we have those candid conversations with them. And thank you for also pointing out I was still on mute, which I apologize for. That's okay. <laughs> but I, I'm going to shift focus to, to one of our offender focus tools that we want to use, and that is looking for prior bad act evidence. And I always think it's better to refer to this uh, just to help educate our courts about the nature of it, is really think of it as other bad acts evidence, because it's not just prior convictions or other convictions, and it's not just prior, but it can also be subsequent acts that are admissible. And of course, what the admissibility of an offender's other bad acts recognize is that most offenders, when they decide to sexually assault or rape a victim, it's not something that they just uh, spontaneously do, but it's something they plan and premeditate. And what the cold case uh, Saki uh, project is showing us is that most offenders are doing it over and over and refining their pattern and doing it. So when we find this evidence of other offending and other victims, it's something we wanna bring out so the jury can, can consider the full scope of issues that are at play in our case with this current victim. Now, sometimes if we're lucky, we'll get a case where a defendant has a prior criminal history that explicitly spells out and shows uh, the, this, uh, the, the other bad acts that can be admissible. A lot of times, though, we're going to have to do a bit deeper digging because a lot of times sexual violence and sexual assault, the system and our, our society, it doesn't always directly address it. It compromises the resolution. And so unpacking what has happened in an offender's history can sometimes uh, be difficult to discern unless we really do our diligent investigation and we get these records. And if there's something that uh, what appears on the surface just to be a dismissal or an adversarial dismissal of our offender, it's really only by digging in on that that we can find out that maybe the context for it was some sort of prior sexual assault or sexual victimization of other people that reveals the, the defendant's method of perpetrating on our victim in our current case, in our present case. We can find this history in civil protection orders, uh, talking to those who might give us more people to talk to, an offender's school records, especially if stuff was just handled at administrative hearings or Title IX proceedings, and also work history type incidents. If we could go next. The other thing in pretrial litigation that we really want to make sure that we get established uh, or clarified for admissibility is our other statements from our victim uh, coming in and statements that are coming in not directly from the victim. Because of course, corroborating our victim in court with other statements he or she made throughout the disclosure, throughout the investigation, is going to be a great way to show the reality of the case, especially when we have trials that are occurring a year or two or even later, heaven forbid, after the original incident. So these other statements that our victim may have made are going to be critical to sort through with pretrial litigation. And even if our court understands these rules pretty well, it's still helpful just to sort of go through our pretrial motions with this, because if for no other reason than when we do this really thorough pretrial litigation, we're going to be building this record that an appellate court is going to be able to consider and rely on uh, if they're in, in case we need an interlocutory appeal or if they're looking for a basis to uphold our court's decision in the event that there's a conviction. Now we next want to transition to uh, finishing talking about pretrial litigation. The other sort of key to success that we have for successful sexual violence prosecutions and alcohol facilitated sexual assault prosecutions is going to be building a good um, multidisciplinary team and network and collaborating with allied professionals. And when we're talking about true collaboration, as prosecutors, we're, we're probably usually maybe sometimes just thinking about, well, we're going to talk to our police officer. Uh, but true collaboration is deeper than that. And it's not just law enforcement, although that's a big component of it. But it's working with our system-based com and community advocates, it's working with our labs and it's working with our, our medical team and medical collaborators trying to build a system of support 
that's built around the victim and built on servicing the victim, including safety plan. All these different disciplines and all these different partners working together to understand the, the, what each of them can provide, educate, and essentially acting as a force multiplier for one another. In part one, we talked a lot about how challenging alcohol facilitated sexual assaults are, uh, but that they can a lot of times be the most common type of sexual assault. To compensate for that challenge, a good multidisciplinary team, advocacy support for the victim, um, filling in the gaps for, for law enforcement and prosecution is really gonna be that force uh, multiplier that can balance these challenges for these cases where a lot of offenders are perpetrating. Now, specifically to the prosecutor, the benefit of this multidiscipline collaboration, it's recognizing that our partners, uh, that it's not an adversarial relationship. It's not supposed to be an adversarial relationship with, uh, with law enforcement or with advocates that are either system or community-based, but recognizing them as resources, not barriers and trying to access them as resources and not barriers. Not only are they that to us, but we're a resource to them. Now, there's a big audience here today and the status of these multidisciplinary relationships, I'm sure is varied from everywhere, from very strong uh, to maybe aspiring to be stronger. Uh, but these multidisciplinary relationships, they're built over time. A lot of jurisdictions have, have implemented the multidisciplinary model for, for child abuse and have seen the benefit. Cases with adult victims have been a little bit slower to follow, but the benefits for the field are, can be recognized. Now, multidisciplinary considerations, hopefully as prosecutors, we're figuring out ways where it can fit in in each part of the process and looking for that input and looking for that deliberation, inviting that support and those resources from our multidisciplinary partners. And I'm not gonna dive into how it can happen at each of these stages, but we should be thinking about how we can incorporate it in each of our cases at each of these stages, hopefully through relationships uh, that have a strong foundation. So now we turn to offender focus once again. And this focus, as we discussed earlier, should be laser-like attention given to the offender. We all know that sexual assault is largely a crime that's premeditated or planned to some extent beforehand. So what we're looking at literally under a microscope is a determination of the offender's intent. And that's whether or not it's an element of the crime. In most jurisdictions, it is not an element of the crime, but particularly in alcohol-facilitated sexual assault cases, we need to be very clear on what the intent was in the planning. We may be dealing with a defendant who's going to claim that he was intoxicated, he was drunk, it was drunk sex. And so our ability to dive beneath the surface and really look into this evidence closely is going to be very important to communicating the reality of the crime to the jury. The victim selection process. If ever there were a, a, a formula uh, that's, that's utilized in a very predatory fashion, it's this. The victim was accessible. The victim was right there, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in a social setting, or even an acquaintance, there is accessibility from the offender to the victim. The second part of that formula is vulnerability. How much more vulnerable can a, a victim be than being intoxicated? We all know that it's a major feature of vulnerability. And the third component of that formula, and this is from the offender's viewpoint or perspective, certainly not ours, it's the offender's consideration of credibility. And it goes somewhat like this. Go ahead, call the police. They're not going to, they're not going to take your call. You were, you're drunk. Nobody's going to believe you. They're not going to believe anyone who's drank like you have. And so that formula becomes very important for us to build upon, to show the jury the evidence of it. And this can actually be used very effectively in a closing argument. The offender's use of planning setting up the scene, scene, grooming. Grooming is, is done with adults as well as children. Isolating the victim 
from her roommate or a friend who's with her. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll give you a ride home. You shouldn't be drinking anyway. And then the exit strategy. I don't think you're going to want to tell anybody because if you do, you're not going to be believed. And, you know, things could be very difficult for you in this campus. And so we're looking at trial strategy and what needs to inform our work when we get into the area of trial strategy is everything that we've learned from our trauma informed approach to interview and all of the evidence that we've been able to develop thanks to our understanding of the role of sensory detail, psychological import, physiological import, all of this adds in to what we're now going to be discussing. And we'll, we'll touch just briefly upon the jury selection process, the kinds of questions that we should ask, trying to build a link between the prospective jurors and ultimately the evidence that we're going to present in trial. We want the opening to provide an insight into the evidence that the jury is going to hear firsthand. And of course, the direct of the victim is the heartbeat of our case. We want to prepare the victim for cross-examination, and we also want to prepare for eventual cross-examination of the defendant if he takes the stand, or how we're going to strategize if he does not take the stand. Expert testimony becomes an important component, as we'll develop just briefly. And then finally, closing argument, where we bring to fruition the reality of the crime for the jury. But it all begins with jury selection. And there are many facets to our work in the courtroom in this regard. We want to try to uncover any potential bias, but we also want to ask experiential questions of the, of the jurors, of the prospective jurors, to basically lay the foundation for evidence that they're going to hear later, helping to establish an experiential link. A question might be such as this, how many of us have had a difficult or traumatic event occur in our lives? We're not going to ask you in this public setting to talk about what happened to you, but we do want to ask, were you able to talk about that right away? Or was there some difficulty associated with it? Were you ever able to talk about it? There are many experiential questions uh, that we can also assist you with if, if you have any questions uh, about your specific cases. We want to be leaders in the courtroom. And one of the things that we are focused on in terms of our leadership is educating the jury as to the law that applies to their consideration of the evidence. We want to give them a glimpse into the impact of trauma on the victim and what the victim's responses were. And we can do this through asking experiential questions that will allow the jury later, when they hear the evidence, to connect their own life experience with the victims. We want to really illumine the, nat the predatory nature of offenders. And we need to keep in mind at all times that these are crimes that are premeditated to some extent and certainly our plan, particularly with alcohol-facilitated sexual assault. And we're also going to be developing information about the effects of alcohol, never forgetting for a moment that even though there is alcohol involved, trauma is still on board. So trying to uncover biases, we're simply trying to gain an understanding of a, of a juror if they're going to be able to relate to important aspects of our case. And there are a number of questions to ask in this area, but what we also do, again, is talk it up with our law enforcement professional, who should also be involved in jury selection whenever possible, and perhaps even discuss some ideas with advocates who are assigned to the case. It's a team effort in all respects, and what we're trying to determine is jurors that can be fair, and impartial in this case. We want to make sure, especially in alcohol facilitated sexual assault, that we can help jurors to develop an understanding of how alcohol may have been utilized by an offender in committing this crime and how that may have impacted the victim's ability to consent. So as leaders in the courtroom, we wanna lift jurors up
We want to be who we are, be the committed and dedicated professionals who we are. And we also want to share with jurors through the kind of leadership that we bring to these cases that we're all in this together. And for that reason, it's important to try to use these pronouns whenever possible, we and us, to really help develop that theme of leadership. We want the jurors to look to us for that kind of leadership in the trial. And we're going to guide their expectations and, and actually we're going to be turning some tough issues or challenges into gold, bringing the offender focus back into the picture. Why was the victim unable to immediately report the assault? Because of the offender's conduct. If there was some kind of initial consent, we need to be very clear about the moment when the victim utilized her right to self-determination and said no. And we will have asked a question about the right to make decisions and about the right to change our minds early on in the, the jury selection process. The offender may not have used violence. And as we all know, the theme of, of these webinars, you don't need force when there is alcohol. And so we need to keep alcohol and the effects of alcohol clearly in, in the forefront with the jury. Thank you, Patty. Uh, so what I'm going to be turning on now for my little section is talking a little bit about opening statements and closing arguments. And then I'm going to kick off a discussion about witness examination. If I could go to the next slide, please. So uh, what we often suggest, and we want to recognize that there is no universal formula for, uh, for the successful opening uh, statement and or closing argument or closing rebuttal argument. Uh, but as general sort of, uh, of principles, what we want to suggest is that when building cases and, and deciding what your trial strategy is going to be is craft your closing argument first and build it around that. But then be open to the development of new evidence at trial. Because as you prepare for the case, in a lot of ways, how the pieces fit together, all these different parts of, of, of evidence that you have and from here and there, the closing argument in a lot of times is gonna be able to make itself and craft itself. What we wanna use our opening statement for is to reinforce this offender-focused theme and preempt defense arguments. I, I think sometimes probably the least impactful opening statement I, I've seen prosecutors make is where the case starts off apologizing for the victim or, or like we're, we're ashamed of the victim. Instead, shift that focus or shift that lens as to understanding how these victim vulnerabilities that we have made this person the perfect victim for our offender and develop and exploit and stress the evidence that's gonna show how our offender found that, identify those vulnerabilities, how they got our victim alone, how they got access to our victim. Talk in your opening statement about cooperating evidence, because again, while our laws are gonna allow the testimony of a victim alone as being sufficient to sustain a conviction if believed beyond a reasonable doubt, a lot of times we're also gonna be looking for that cooperating evidence and explain what the scope of cooperating evidence can be. Maybe this is something we talked a little bit about during voir dire, so our, so our jury is already understanding of this concept or open to this concept. But what we want our jury to understand is that cooperation enhances and builds on credibility. Now, for witness examinations, direct examination, cross-examination, and redirect, what we first want to recognize is that strategy is critical. And if I could get to the next slide. And what this means is, and beyond just our victim, for every witness we call, we want to be thinking of it, not just we have all these witnesses listed in discovery and we're just checking them off and calling all of them because they're available for us, but that we're strategically thinking about why we're calling this witness. Uh, that we're thinking about what is the best order to call this witness. And I don't think there's any one answer to this case. And these are the kinds of things that I think are going to questions that are going to keep trial lawyers up at night. But these are things we want to be asking in each case. Maybe sometimes we want to put a first responder on first who talked to our victim when they were most distraught. Maybe sometimes we do want to start with our victim first. 
maybe we want to talk to the people who process the scene first. So our jury is going to have context for things later, later on. The general rule is we want to begin and end with strong witnesses. But before we go to the next slide, in thinking of why you're calling witnesses, one thing I want to put out, and, and different prosecutors I've seen have different approaches, in a lot of alcohol-facilitated sexual assault cases, more often than not, we're going to be dealing with some sort of consent defense. If our offender gave an interview to an investigator, and it's entirely self-serving, think carefully, gee, do we really need to call this investigator as to the offender statement, as opposed to losing the opportunity to maybe cross-examine our offender? Maybe we do need to get our investigator or whoever took admissions or statements from the offender in, because there's some sort of cooperation of our victim's disclosure that we want to get into evidence or that we can build on. Uh, but sometimes if there's a consent defense, it can be, it, it can be helpful to, to let the defendant assert that by, by if, taking the stand rather than giving them the statement they gave to law enforcement. That's not the strategy for every case, but it's certainly something we should be looking on. For our investigators, we, there can be a range. Sometimes we might be working with investigators who have really informed practice and training and understanding of sexual violence cases. Sometimes we don't have that as asset available for us. In either circumstance, though, we want to use that as an opportunity to build up the credibility of our victim and enhance the credibility of our victim. Ask our investigators about the demeanor of witnesses at each point. Develop our investigators' expertise, if they, especially if it was informed by good practice. Have them explain to the jury why they talked to the victim multiple times. Um, why do they put the victim in touch with the service provider? Help the jury understand the full impact that these crimes have on this victim and victims generally that this investigator works with. And if there were mistakes and misperceptions, we, those are things that have to be owned. Um, ideally, our investigator is going to be or our law enforcement folks are going to be able to own that. But if not, we have to be able to do that in a diplomatic and thoughtful and considerate way that, that serves our duty to, to the case and, and, and obtaining justice for the victim. Now, for a direct examination of the victim, the thing to remember and that we want to be careful about is that we're not just trying to use our victim to check off the elements of whatever crimes the offender is charged with us. Uh, but we want the victim to be understood by our jury as, as a living, breathing, feeling person uh, with their vulnerabilities or without. Uh, introduce the victim. And same thing we were doing in rapport. Think of some questions during examination so the jury can understand a little bit about this victim and have a baseline from which to relate to this victim about how they understand things. And hopefully, able to calm our victim on some level too. Is there, is there going to be nervous about the, the stand? Give the context for the assault. What happened well before the assault? And again, what happened after? Um, we, there's challenging aspects of the case, but we want to talk about that through the lens of offender focus, not the why questions why, of our victim. Why did you do this? Or why didn't you do that? But when were you first able to contact someone for help? When was the moment you knew you were in danger? Um, how was he able to get you alone? Things of that nature. And using, utilizing those trauma-informed interviewing techniques throughout. Breaking down our direct examination, of course, an introduction, a reaction to a crime, but in some senses too, a double direct or triple direct. And some, what we mean by this is by trying to, to use reiteration or repetition to sort of build the details of our case. Maybe first our victims answer to open-ended questions on direct, then uh, followed through follow-up. Then maybe we have photo exhibits of the scene of the crime or at least the exterior if we weren't able to get interior shots of the crime and asking the victim if they can explain or follow what that shows. Following the trauma, and more, most importantly too, the, the harmful or the challenges in victim behavior, we wanna to try to ask those questions up front during direct examination and make those questions a bit blunted for cross-examination. Segway next to cross-examination, we wanna identify the possible topics. 
And how we can do that, is a lot of times we're going to be able to understand these issues. Experience can be a great uh, benefactor in doing this. But even if we don't have experience to do it, we want to be listening to the defense attorney uh, while the case is pending, while all this pretrial litigation is going on. All too often, defense attorneys will be willing to pitch to us as prosecutors all the things that are wrong with our case in hopes of negotiating a resolution favorable to the offender or their client. Those are great opportunities for us to sort of anticipate or pick out uh, what the defense is planning on emphasizing or building on at trial and then preparing to counter that or at least blunt that. And I hand it over to Patty now. Thank you, John. So turning to offender testimony, this is the ultimate in offender focus and we've discussed that throughout this presentation. We know that offenders want to talk. They want to tell their side of the story. They also are very focused on social myths and misperceptions. They're part of society as well, and they pretty much know what they are. And they basically rely on those social myths and misperceptions in terms of what they want to say in their testimony. We also know that they may have committed crimes before that are similar to the crime that's now before the jury. As another reference for Evidence Rule 404B, other crimes and other acts, CODIS hits. CODIS hits may give us additional information about other victims that have been victimized by this particular offender. And we're seeing a relatively significant incidence of serial and repeat offenders thanks to the work that's being done in the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative. So these are some strategies to consider for cross-examination. If there are areas of agreement, specifically peripheral details, the time where the event took place at, it's good to get agreement on as many aspects of this as possible. But what we also want to develop, as John mentioned, is the offender's awareness of intoxication, which means vulnerability. And remember, we still have accessibility, vulnerability, and how the offender wants us and the jury to view credibility. And so we want to weave this through so we can draw this to its fruition in our closing argument. When it's appropriate, we can follow the offender's narrative, but when we prepare for cross-examination, we're not necessarily going to follow the order of questions that the defense attorney is going to. We like to start with a strong point and then continue building. And within that building process, if there is a narrative that is important for us to continue building upon or, or drawing reference to with the offender, we can certainly do that. So we're going to turn now to expert testimony. And the, the federal rules of evidence, all of the states have basically the same, if not a very similar rule. We're talking about witnesses who are qualified by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education. And this lays out the four different areas of importance on expert testimony. And we all need to be very in touch with our statutes for expert testimony, particularly in alcohol facilitated rape cases. We might have access to experts who are going to be important uh, to explain either toxicology or victim responses uh, to trauma or victim behavior. And as I mentioned, toxicology is certainly an area. We want to, if we have evidence of a blood alcohol content of the victim or the offender, this may cause us to focus on the testimony of a professional who has that training. A toxicologist certainly could be of assistance or maybe even a law enforcement professional who's been specifically trained in that area. We might want to draw forward information for the jury about the synergistic effects of alcohol and drugs. There's a lot of information in this area that we can obtain from a toxicologist and sometimes even a pharmacologist who can talk about this. A SANE may be trained also in seeing some of these impact points if a victim was able to present for medical care within a, a relatively short period of time. 
the disparate effects of alcohol on, on men versus women, the difference in size, the difference in the consumption of alcohol, the burn-off rate that might be involved, all of these can result in a disparate effect. And that's also information that we want to bring forward to the jury. Blackout versus pass out. The claim of blackout is a, another way of surfacing a consent defense. The argument is the victim may not remember it, but she actually, but she actually consented. Expert testimony in this area can be important as well as the victim's testimony about passing out, feeling everything going dark, and then waking up at another point. This is not a blackout, but it's clearly from the victim's testimony as foundation for the expert's testimony, it is a pass out. So one of the experts we want to zero in on, and we, we spent some time in part one, and Patty just spent some additional time talking about toxicologists, but the other kind of expert witness we want to discuss are experts that can help explain, and probably we should say a better way to say than explain, is educate about victim behavior. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about victim behavior experts and using them at trial to help a jury understand the variety of victim behaviors and victim responses to sexual violence. Uh, now, these victim behavior experts are not intended to be utilized as truth detectors or there to give an opinion as to whether this victim was or was not raped um, or whether this uh, offender does or doesn't meet the profile of a sexual predator. But what a good victim behavior expert's going to do is just educate a jury uh, in, about their expectations that there's a certain kind of response to sexual violence. A good victim behavior expert is going to be able to help a jury understand that there isn't any specific response. A victim of sexual violence might have a full disclosure or a partial disclosure or a delayed disclosure. A uh, rape victim might have a matter of fact demeanor a, uh, a, a laughing demeanor or a very sort of distraught and, and, and teary demeanor. These things in of themselves aren't going to be able to help us determine whether a victim was or was not sexual assaulted. And why, why this is so critical for us as the prosecution is because our jury does have expectations based on rape myths about how victims should respond. And a victim behavior expert is hopefully going to help a jury understand that that's just that these these are myths and that's not going to help the answer the question of what the evidence proves or has failed to prove. Now the practical analysis for victim behavior experts is that we need to identify behaviors that need explaining. And this is where this multidisciplinary investigation, this good collaboration network can help us understand these issues. Because um, certainly by working with victim advocates and working with community advocates, as well as our own experience and law investigators, we can identify maybe these behaviors and victims that seem counterintuitive to us, we can get a better understanding and better context for. And we can start thinking about strategies, including witnesses that might be used or helpful to educate the fact finder. Now, the kind of expert, victim behavior expert, we know don't necessarily need it for every sexual assault case, because sometimes um, maybe if there is explicit threats, a delayed disclosure is going to be self-explanatory, and we're not going to need a victim behavior expert uh, to explain that. But when we are considering experts, just as we do with any other kind of experts, we want to Now, who can be a possible expert? And, and I think when we're choosing between a victim behavior expert, there's going to be some balance. We're going to be looking for someone who's highly credentialed or highly experiential. The credentialed person is going to be more the academic person who studied and researched about victim behaviors and victim responses to sexual violence. The experiential person is going to be, and Patty had read the Federal Rule of Evidence 702, which most jurisdictions follow, follow on some level, which is just through experience, going to have some specialized knowledge that's beyond the ken of normal person. Um, all things equal, if having the, the ideal situation is to have someone who's a good combination of experiential and credentialed. 
Uh, but if you have to choose between the two, I think it's always better to err on the side of experiential because that kind of expert, their, their expertise is based on their personal experience and their personal knowledge, which is really hard to rebut as opposed to maybe a very credentialed expert to rely more on disputed studies or subjective studies on many levels. So the logistical process we wanna to use to secure this expert for trial is we identify our expert. And when we identify the expert, maybe we wanna have two levels of experts. Maybe the experts or advocacy experts on our, uh, on our multidisciplinary team or our SART is gonna help work with us to understand these issues. But the expert we use for trial testimony because they're not there to opine or give an, a, any sort of uh, opinion to our jury about the credibility of this victim, they don't really need any of the discovery in the case, uh, in our case, because what the expert victim behavior experts were gonna utilize there for trial, they're just there to educate about victim behaviors. So the only thing they have to know is rather than anything about the specifics of our case or our victim, just what victim behaviors are, are gonna be might be under consideration or a jury might need to be ed educated about. However, even if we're not giving discovery to our victim behavior expert we're going for trial, we do need to meet our obligations to the defense. And that goes, of course, with the pretrial litigation Patty and I were talking about earlier, but it means not playing games, getting a copy of our expert's CV. If we're using an experiential expert who maybe never has developed a CV, we want to work with them to do that. And we also want to reduce what they're going to testify about in an expert report. Now, if they haven't reviewed, if our victim behavior expert hasn't reviewed any discovery in our case, this is expert report is just going to be about the sort of victim behavior challenges we're asking them to address. So if we could go to the next slide. Now the legal basis, and I know not everyone at the seminar is from, from at this event webinar is from New York State, but People v. Taylor is a good case. Um, and of course, even uh, if you're not in New York, it's going to give you good head notes you can find maybe to develop arguments and forms and, and motions in your own jurisdiction. And you should contact Equitas too if you're not used to using victim behavior experts because we can assist you with sample motions, transcripts, things of that nature. But this pretty much lays out the basis about why we're going to be arguing about the relevance of a victim behavior expert at trial and articulates it really well and maybe gives us some kind of language we want to adapt or apply or use to persuade our own courts. And the relevance, of course, is, is and I'm not going to reread the quote that you have on the screen because you can all read it yourselves, of course, is the relevance of a victim behavior expert is that victim behavior in responses to sexual violence, they aren't in the normal understanding of our average juror. Just like experts are going to be used in drug trafficking or constructive delivery cases, we're going to need experts to explain things in sexual violence cases about victim behaviors and victim responses that aren't in the normal understanding of jurors. Uh, and so, of course, the, that relevance or that reality of a misconception by folks who make up our juries about how victims respond to sexual violence or what is or isn't a normal behavior uh, recognizes about why these experts are going to be needed in case in cases and here's a military justice case U, USV Pagal um, who again might be able to give you some good research leads for your own jurisdiction but you should also reach out to us if I could go to the next slide please now I've referenced of course using a blind expert versus a general expert blind experts in a lot of ways for testifying a trial are going to be preferred because the sole purpose is to educate the jury this blind victim behavior experts not met with our particular victim. They're not diagnosing the, their victim. They're staying in their lane. They're avoiding discussion of diagnoses and syndrome, and they know very little about the facts of the case. They're just there to talk about whatever challenges are involved. The victim behavior expert isn't going to be commenting on the credibility of the victim or making a finding that the victim was raped and they're not going to be diagnosing the victim. They're just going to be there to explain dynamics, uh, such as delay, delayed disclosure and other phenomena. Now, if we aren't utilizing an expert or we can't use an expert, the other strategies we might want to use to explain victim behavior and victim responses is sometimes our victims can articulate that experience and the reasons for their responses. 
maybe why there is a piecemeal disclosure or partial disclosure. And that can really help corroborate their testimony, talking about how scared or frightened they were. Sometimes our detectives or medical examiners are going to be able to talk about that because they've worked with lots of victims and uh, things that maybe our defense attorney or the friends on the defense bar are arguing are unusual. Our, our investigators and medical professionals, healthcare professionals won't find that unusual or shocking. And that experience can be put in context with the jury. And also using voir dire too as a tool, maybe in our panel members own experiences to help our eventual jury to understand the range of responses and the reality of, of a lot of challenges that are all too regular in our, regular in our cases. And it's also important to note, uh, even if an expert is going to testify, the victim's testimony still remains important. We're going to ask questions of the victim that basically lays the foundation for the questions that we're going to ask the expert. The jury is going to be tracking information that perhaps the victim was unable to provide for our later discussion with an expert on what specific reasons may impact a victim. We're talking very general, as John noted, may impact a victim in an ability to recount certain information. So there's still a connection. And as we all know, trials are a very dynamic process. So going forward, we want to ensure that the interviews that we're conducting, that actually we're privileged to conduct for victims, are done in a trauma-informed way. We want to use all of our available tools in recreating the reality of that crime by asking the sensory questions, by proceeding to answer, ask questions about psychological impact, and sometimes even physiological responses. This really helps us convey to the jury the victim's experience of the crime that the offender caused. Engaging in pretrial litigation, as John and I have discussed, is important because what it does, it allows jurors an opportunity to render a fair and just verdict based upon the evidence that should be considered. It also is a means of protecting victims from exposure to invasion of privacy that is basically irrelevant in any given case. It, it answers victims' questions about how much are they going to be able to ask me. We're able to convey to a victim what the court's rulings are in that regard. And of course, our best efforts to be responsive to any issues that occur during the trial. As John did a great job of explaining, it's our collaboration with allied professionals that really enhances the work that we are privileged to do for victims. We obtain a deeper understanding of evidence. We're able to provide more holistic and effective support to victims as well. But keeping our attention on the offenders from the very beginning, when that case enters our office, we need to look at what the offender's role was, particularly in these cases of alcohol facilitated rape. How was the offender able to commit this crime? What kind of planning went into it? What is the evidence of premeditation? Who had control over the situation? Who made all of the decisions in the case? It's this kind of focus that puts us in the most powerful of all positions when we're arguing in our closing argument why the offender should be accountable for the crime that we have provided compelling evidence of. So we're at the point where John and I both have an opportunity to thank you. I want to thank Cynthia for her great assistance throughout the entirety of this webinar. We really appreciate it, Cynthia. and want to thank all of you uh, who have been able to participate today. We'd be honored at Equitas if you'd be in, in touch with John or I or any of our colleagues. We'd be delighted to support your efforts. We're proud of the work that you do and are hopeful that the information we provided you today, that you'll be able to utilize this and even enhance your efforts in working for victims of sexual assault.
Patty, if I can just add to, to what you, there's Patty's contact information for all the hard uh, questions you have. My contact information is here for all of your easy questions or easier questions. No, seriously, you can contact either one of us and either of us would be delighted to help you. Um, there, this uh, Part one of this is already available on our website and can be viewed as a recording. I'm sure part two is going to be available in the near future. Um, I don't anticipate any technical difficulties happening with that getting online. I hope we've answered all your questions. If we didn't, um, please, uh, if we didn't get to your specific question, we tried to get as many as we could to live, but sometimes that's challenging to do when we're trying to pay attention to one another and, and engage with the content. Please email us afterwards and, and we'll be happy to follow up as, uh, or if we have a record of it, follow, uh, we'll, we'll respond to you directly. But thank you everybody uh, for, uh, for attending today's webinar, for folks who were part one and part two, special appreciation to, to all of you. Um, and thank you all for your, the work you do, which in easier times is uh, stressful enough. And in these hard times, I know can also be, uh, be exponentially challenging. So if you don't get thanked enough, please let uh, know now that uh, you, you don't go unappreciated. And we're very grateful for the work you do for your communities and for victims. And uh, thank you, Patty and Cynthia, for, uh, for doing this. Thank you all. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>